Welcome back, my friends. Currently, we're on day 169 of Russia's disastrous invasion of Ukraine, and the top story today continues to be the widespread destruction seen after blasts at a Russian base in Crimea. This is the Saki Air Force Base, and it's located on the west coast of occupied Crimea. This is about 200 kilometers from the front lines, and of all the pictures and videos that I've found on social media taken by Russian tourists, this is the best one. I'm not going to play it for you because I don't want to get in trouble with YouTube, but I'll link it down below. But just from the still frame image, you can see that this is pretty bad. There's a huge mushroom cloud forming over here, and then hundreds of meters away on this Air Force base, there's another mushroom cloud forming giving the indication that a coordinated strike occurred at the same time to cause the most damage and destruction to this airbase. But Russian state TV, Russian propaganda has already announced that no Ukrainian missiles were involved in these explosions at this airfield, explaining that it was a detonation and stressing that there was no external impact on the site. So Russia wants to stick to the story that maybe a Russian soldier was careless with his cigarette and dropped it next to some fertilizer, which caused a minor explosion. And this is the incredible claim that Russia State TV is making that no aviation equipment was damaged in Crimea from this accidental explosion. And I want to pause on an outrageous claim such as this because... There are people in the YouTube community, for whatever reason, who choose to believe it. So here's a comment that was left on my channel one hour prior to filming this video, and I want to read it to you. In accident, the Russians said, No proof Ukrainians caused the damage, but since when does propaganda need proof, implying that I'm propaganda? View this video with a huge dose of skepticism, talking about my video from two days ago. And I want to I wanna pause and talk about lessons we've learned from fiction. Potentially the best book written in the 20th century was George Orwell's 1984. And I'm going to read this quote for you. The party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final, most essential command. And if all others accepted the lie which the party imposed, if all records told the same tale, then the lie passed into history and became truth. For people choosing to believe Russia, I'm about to show you evidence that your eyes can see for themselves. But when George Orwell wrote this book in 1948, yes, there are lessons to be applied to Western countries, to be applied to Western democracies, but when Orwell wrote this book in 1948, the most extreme totalitarian, authoritarian, Orwellian society was the Soviet Union. And the world let out a sigh of relief in 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed. But here we are 30 years later, and the Soviet Union's successor is the same guy. It's Moscow. It's the Russians. So in Russia today, they do not have freedom of speech. They do not have freedom of press. If you even call this war a war, you can be arrested and sent to prison for 15 years. So let me show you the evidence, because I don't think 80 years ago, even George Orwell, a science fiction writer, could have imagined a future in which anyone has access to satellite imagery from private companies taking pictures every day, and you can see for yourself the before and after of the destruction of this Russian Air Force Base. So here is a, a satellite picture the day before. This is the corral where they keep all of the jets. And here's the day after this accidental detonation that the Russians are claiming. Lots of aviation equipment looks damaged to me. And it seems pretty obvious that something struck here something struck here, something struck here, with the intent of destroying these planes. Here's another satellite image the day before. You can see there's six planes parked here with various equipment next to them. There's another three planes over here. 
And here's a picture of the airfield the day after. So who are you going to believe? Your eyes with satellite images or the Kremlin or Russia? I'll link all of these images and the sources for them down below in the description, but I, I can't do anything about people who choose to run into the arms of Big Brother and embrace him. There are just a very small minority of people in this world who want to live like that. There's also pictures of uh, cars that were hundreds of meters away from the airbase that were completely destroyed and burned out. Here's a video that shows a helicopter rotor Part of the explosion, it flew into the cabin of this sedan. I'll, I'll link this video down below. So just from satellite images and what we can gather from evidence on the grounds, uh, this is the reported damage. Eight Su-24s, six Mi-8 helicopters, five Su-24s, four Su-30Ms, one IL-20RT, and four ammunition depots. Russia thought this base was safe. Additionally, 60 pilots and military personnel serving at the airfield were killed, in addition to 100 more that were injured. And Ukraine did this deliberately. They attacked this airbase on a Monday morning when it's all hands on deck, everybody on Monday show up for work, because they wanted to maximize the amount of military personnel, especially pilots that were killed. You know, uh, aircraft can be replaced at a dollar cost, but to replace a pilot, that takes years. A competent pilot uh, is going to take years to replace. Russia has to be experiencing an extreme pilot shortage. Another huge embarrassment for the Russian military is where was their air defense system? Why weren't these uh, military personnel and all this equipment properly being protected? And this base was supposed to be protected by an overlapping coverage of two S-400 battalions, backed up by state-of-the-art air defense networks and multiple electronic warfare and ASR radars. Meaning that Ukraine, with the help of NATO, has successfully cracked and broke all of this. Whatever Russia is using to defend their people and defend their assets, it's not working. So the Russian military is panicking right now. They're freaking out. They're having serious discussions of, do they need to withdraw valuable military equipment out of Crimea back to Russia proper in order to protect it? They don't care about the people, but I imagine that Russia does care about their equipment more. So the, the, the conspiracy, the question, the confusion is, was this U.S.-provided Attackums missiles or was this some domestic ballistic missile that Ukraine developed uh, domestically? And before we go any further, I want to make a correction. In prior videos, I've been casual with my language and terminology. But GMLRS rockets are specific to these smaller, shorter range missiles that are used by the Mars 2, the M270, and the 142 HIMARS system. You can see that there are six missiles that fit in a single cartridge in the launcher. But the, lar the larger, longer range Attackums missiles, it's a different name, different than GMRS, these are the ones that are single, that go in the cartridge, and they can go a farther distance and are much more destructive. Here's a thread from Ukraine Battle Map in which he makes the argument that I believe currently that this wasn't uh, a domestic produced missile system by Ukraine, but instead was U.S. provided Attackums. So let's go through these points together. One, the range of the Attackums is 300 kilometers and the airbase is at least 210 kilometers from Ukrainian controlled territory. Okay. Two, the attack happened one day after U.S. provided more ammunition for the HIMARS and didn't specify what type. So here you can see the HIMARS and this is a single very large Attackum coming out of the uh, coming out of the cartridge point three in early august an agm-88 anti-radar missile uh, was provided to ukraine but not publicly disclosed by the united states uh, it was only after russian forces found debris they found the, the serial number and the name of it that the united states finally admitted that we gave the ukrainians 
anti-radiation missiles. What do these do? They seek out and destroy radar systems. So this is a huge embarrassment for the Russian Air Force, but they should have complete air dominance. Complete air dominance over Ukraine to the, the point where they can fly and do whatever they want. But after six months, they've been unable to achieve this. All they have is relative air superiority. But the United States is providing Ukraine with these anti-radiation missiles that can seek out and destroy radar-emitting platforms so that Ukraine can destroy them all. And I think in the next couple months, Ukraine is going to be the one with air superiority over Russia. This is essential before the United States can start providing F-16s, A-10s, Predator drones. Uh, in addition, Ukraine can fly their own drones, uh, as well as the Bayraktar from Turkey. So uh, point four, this is the Grom-2. This potentially is uh, the domestically made Ukrainian uh, ballistic missile system. It has a predict predictable trajectory, and it's much easier for the Russians to shoot down rather than U.S.-provided attackums. The Grom-2 is also not known to be operational, and more than likely would require extensive testing before you would use it on your enemy. You would, you would want to know it would work before you would waste it trying to attack an Air Force base. Point six, uh, the, from the satellite images, the strikes resemble devastation from an Attackums missile. The Grom-2 likely would have a bigger crater and have a smaller radius of damage, whereas these Attackums missiles... Uh, prior to impact, the front of it opens up and explodes, and there's all this basic buckshot that shoots out in order to cause a wider range of, uh, of damage. Point seven, uh, the U.S., if it was a domestically made missile system, they wouldn't have that many of them, whereas if it is an attackums, they can start going after a list of targets because uh, the United States, over time, is going to keep providing them with these missiles. So what is the Russian reaction? What is the Russian response? We need to get the F out of here. Fear has gripped the Crimea Peninsula, and Russians are fleeing for the exits. Uh, lots of pictures and videos on social media of the multiple hour-long waits to get to the Kerch Bridge in order to safely get off the peninsula. I really like this video because you can see a bicyclist going in the opposite direction. While everyone else is trying to get off the peninsula, this guy is going the other direction, just trying to get some exercise before the impending invasion. Lots of good memes online of the insensitivity of these Russian tourists, National Lampoon's Crimea vacation. I just don't get it, guys. The, their own soldiers, their own Russian citizens are dying on the front lines, not even 200 kilometers away. There's Russian bombers and jets and missiles flying overhead. And these civilians have chosen to go to Crimea and just enjoy a summer vacation on the beach. I, I don't understand the mindset of the average Russian. Not getting as much headlines, there was another deep strike that occurred on a bridge connecting Crimea to closer to Melitopol. There's not as many civilians out here to take pictures and videos, so it's not getting as much attention. But this is more than 70 kilometers from uh, uh, Ukrainian-controlled territory. So whatever longer-range system Ukraine now possesses, they were using it to strike this bridge. Following up on the last two videos where we've talked about the Kakovka hydroelectric power plants in order to isolate the Russian forces completely on the north bank of the Dnipro River, they need to sever this bridge so they can't resupply by rail or truck. It's the canal lock uh, just south of the hydroelectric plant. This is threading the needle, but this is the Achilles heel for this uh, supply line. And for whatever reason, Russian soldiers keep taking pictures and videos and posting it on social media. This is very bad operational security, OPSEC, and this is what the current damage and destruction to this bridge looks like. Uh, let's just watch about 30 seconds of this together. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Here's the hydroelectric power dam. Uh, this is <laughs> this is very close. This is very uh, nerve-wracking that they would choose to use HIMARS to strike within, but the HIMARS has proven to be very accurate. Here is the rail line. Here's a picture of the rail line going over that canal lock. They've completely punched through it. It's going to take Russia some time to fix this, so Russia is not going to be able to resupply their forces by rail on the north bank of the Dnipro. They already destroyed the other rail bridge, so Russia is starting to sweat over this. Also not getting as much attention because everyone's enjoying the destruction of this Russian Air Force base, but uh, Ukraine continues to use their HIMARS launchers to take out Russian command posts. Anytime a colonel has a meeting with a major, Ukra Ukraine's probably going to get the intel of where and when they'll be, and they're going to strike that in order to sever the head of Russian military leadership. This isn't getting as much uh, fanfare and attention because stri striking ammunition depots and command posts is so July 2022. In August 2022, we want to see naval bases and air force bases getting destroyed. Also bad news for the Russians is that Ukrainian resistance in the occupied territories is intensifying. Russia keeps trying to appoint people to be in charge of various, uh, you know, government agencies in these controlled areas, and partisans keep assassinating these collaborators. Uh, I, I, I don't know all the details of each individual person, but if you're willing to cooperate with Russian war crimes, you're probably an enemy of the state at that point. Good news for Ukraine, three additional M270s and lots of rockets are being donated from Great Britain. Between the German Mars II, uh, the M270, and, and the HIMARS, Ukraine has well over 20 of these launchers. The launchers is not the limitation, it's not the bottleneck, it's how many of these GMLS and ATACMS missiles that the United States can ship across the ocean. Here's an update for Russia's manning crisis. If you remember months ago, they were talking about all these Syrian mercenaries that were going to be brought to Ukraine. That didn't work. They also tried raising the age limits for joining Russian, the Russian military to the age of 65. That didn't work. The Wagner Group then tried recruiting Russians from prisons. The prisoners said, no thanks, I'd rather stay in a Russian prison. That didn't work. There was this insane desperation story of maybe 100,000 troops coming from North Korea. That's not going to work. So here is the next brilliant idea, and the Wagner Group is trying to recruit forces from Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan to go fight for them in Ukraine. Salary is 240,000 rubles a month, plus you will be given Russian citizenship. In response to this, uh, Uzbekistan has threatened to imprison any Uzbek citizens that go to Ukraine to fight. Uh, this is put out by the embassy for Uzbekistan in Russia. So that, that probably isn't going to work. Another piece of good news for Ukraine is that they have about $20 billion worth of foreign debt and creditors have decided to postpone sovereign interest and capital payments for bonds that were going to mature in 2022 and 2023. In the short term, this will save Ukraine some money. But more than likely, when this war is over, $300 billion worth of Russian funds were, were, were frozen and seized, and I think they're going to use Russian money to forgive this debt or repay this debt. Only seems fair with everything that Russia has done. Let's wrap up this video with some cool pics and videos, and here is some uh, group photos from the 72nd Mechanized Brigade of Ukraine. This is a very uh, fun picture of these fine gentlemen posing with all of their nice equipment. Here's another one of them on a bridge with the uh, sun in the background. Here's a painting I found from a Ukrainian artist that seems fitting with all of these strikes currently occurring on bridges as uh, Ukrainians are attempting to repel or expel uh, Russian forces. The artist who painted this is Oleg Shupliak. You can follow him on Instagram if you want. He's got 
44,000 followers, which is very impressive. He's based in Ukraine, and he puts out some really nice artwork about what's going on in this war. Final video I want to share with you is of female Ukrainian soldiers returning home to visit family and friends. This clip's kind of a feel-good. It's about two minutes long. Let's just watch it together. That's all for this update video. Glory to the heroes, glory to Ukraine. If you found this video informative, give me a thumbs up. It really helps out with the algorithm. If you have any comments or questions or know something I don't, let me know down below. I love hearing from you guys. Till the next video, take care, be safe.